Hi there, I'm Adam McDermott. With the remaster of Crash Bandicoot coming out soon, what better time than now to go back to the PS1 era and see how the original holds up after all these years, as well as looking at its legacy. Developed by Naughty Dog, who are best known today as the creators of Uncharted and The Last of Us, Crash Bandicoot made his PlayStation debut on September 9th, 1996. For this video, I played it on a PS3 after buying it from the PlayStation Store. This version allowed me to play in the original 4-3 aspect ratio or full screen. There is also a smoothing option to make it look a little better. Overall, the game ran fine except for several uncharacteristic crashes on one infuriating level. More on that later. After I launched the game, I was caught off guard by the complete lack of context for Crash's adventure. Here is a level, go beat it. Only after finishing a few levels did I check online to see if there was indeed no story cinematic. Turns out there is, but it is only viewable if you wait a few moments at the main menu. So if you are eager to play right away, like me, you'll miss the whopping 37 second opening cutscene. In that time, it is revealed Dr. Cortex wants a bandicoot to lead his army to world domination. However, all his experiments have been a failure. One of those failures is Crash, who manages to escape. Annoyed, Cortex readies his next experiment, with the female bandicoot as his subject. And that's it. Crash washes up on shore, and off I go. I guess I'm meant to save the female bandicoot, but there are 32 levels. Surely by the time I finish them all, the experiment will be over, especially considering Crash's one took less than 15 seconds. Analyzing the story is futile, as let's be honest, it's not a priority. What this game prioritizes are the levels, which I had a lot of fun tackling. Each one is short and sweet in the beginning, giving a sense of momentum as I complete one after another in a matter of minutes. Later on, however, Crash Bandicoot becomes a real challenge. I felt immense satisfaction completing some levels that had my hands sweaty as I inched closer to the end, hearing the distant, glorious sound of the teleporter. What adds to the challenge is the odd way the game handles saving. It can only be done at these bonus stages, which are accessed by collecting three emblems of the female bandicoot. Being transported to a more cheerful setting with upbeat music playing in the background offers a respite and some relief from the increasingly difficult levels. However, if I don't get to the end of the bonus stage, then no save opportunity, making for a depressing return. While I liked the majority of levels, there was one that broke me. Slippery Climb. I hate this level. I had 30 lives when I started and all 30 vanished. The amount of precision jumping required is beyond my ability. I made my way through other difficult levels like the high road which tested my depth perception, but with Slippery Climb I felt hampered by Crash's heavy movement. Him not being the most responsive character wasn't an issue in other levels, but became a burden on this one. Combine that with moving platforms, disappearing steps, massive birds to leap on, the dreary setting mirroring my mood, this level was my Everest. And I never beat it. Why? Because, as I alluded to earlier, this was the level the game kept crashing on. Reaching the first checkpoint is an achievement that took me countless tries, but at random it would crash here. Then I have to restart the game and the level all over again, with only three lives available before another dreaded game over screen. In the end, I didn't have the patience to battle against this injustice, and used a password to clear the level and I don't feel bad about it. I was able to continue the rest of the game while being sufficiently challenged, not cheated. For me, Slippery Climb and technical issues are this game's sole blemish. Levels are designed with enough variety to avoid being repetitive. They had me running away from boulders, riding a hog, navigating great heights, racing through a dimly lit castle, saying hello to tribesmen, and marching through a madman's lair. 
The levels also didn't have me moving in the same direction too consecutively. I would run forward for one level, sideways for another, or towards the camera for a daring escape. The combination of different movement directions, settings and obstacles, with the occasional boss fight thrown in, meant Crash Bandicoot remained fresh from start to finish. Completing the game is just the beginning. For those looking for an extra challenge and a secret ending, you will need to collect all the gems by breaking every box in the majority of levels while not dying. This is hard and I didn't feel any incentive to pursue the endeavour. I do like that there is an option for me to continue playing with additional challenges and I may attempt it down the line, but I was content with my single playthrough. I was pleasantly surprised by how much I enjoyed this now 21 year old game. Bouncing through early levels but being tested by later ones. Good variety and immense replay value for those who want it. I wouldn't say it's a must play, but if you're in the mood for a simple and fun game, you can't go wrong with Crash Bandicoot. Those are my humble thoughts, but how did people react when it was released? Critically, it did well, not groundbreaking, but averaged an 8 out of 10. It was praised for its graphics, animation and diverse setting, but the main criticism was that it didn't bring anything new to the table, which is understandable because Super Mario 64 came out around the same time and set a new bar for what is expected from a platformer. Luckily for Crash, Super Mario was only on the N64, so the best platformer available on PlayStation that year went on to sell a lot of copies. 6.8 million. Making it one of the best selling games of all time on the PlayStation. This feat was achieved with the help of Crash becoming the mascot Sony were seeking after their ill-received first mascot, Polygon Man. While Crash wasn't pushed too much in Japan as they didn't like the idea of having a cartoony mascot, Sony America viewed him as their Mario killer and put him in quite a few odds, yet funny ads. Stop looking at me! Well, they put a man in a Crash costume who wandered about with a megaphone challenging Plumber Boy to a fight and preaching about how great the PlayStation was. I will leave a link in the description to these delightful time capsules. Is that Italian? No, Bandicoot, it's an Australian name. In the wake of Crash Bandicoot's success, Naughty Dog went to work on a sequel. A mere 13 months later, Crash Bandicoot 2 Cortex Strikes Back was released to a much better critical reception than its predecessor thanks to the improved save system and tighter controls. Dovetailing the high ratings with a sizable advertising budget, catapulted it to an impressive 7.5 million copies sold. Naughty Dog didn't rest on their laurels and released two more games in the next two years. Crash Bandicoot Warped, providing more of what fans loved of the series, and Crash Team Racing, which was a departure from platforming and instead delivered one of the best racing games on the PlayStation. Unfortunately, this marks the last great entry in the series. After Crash Team Racing, the Bandicoot series went multi-platform and Naughty Dog stepped down as developers. Since then, eight different studios have worked on Crash games and four separate publishers have held the rights for a couple of years each. With the series being thrown around so much, the quality suffered, as did sales. The most recent game released was Crash Bandicoot Nitro Kart 2 for iOS. The last entry in the main series was the poorly received Crash Mind Over Mutant in 2008. Instead of going out on a high, Sony's once proud and bold mascot ended his run on a whimper. However, this series refused to die. After many, many teases, at E3 2016, Sean Layden from Sony strolled onto stage and announced that the original trilogy is going to be remastered from the ground up for the PS4. Fans around the world rejoiced. It is likely that sales of this trilogy will determine whether or not we see a brand new Crash adventure. The impact of the first game is undeniable. 
crash became the mascot for Sony in America, being thrust to the forefront of their marketing campaign for the next several years. It also launched a franchise still adored to this day that went on to sell over 50 million copies across 18 games in 13 years. A remarkable accomplishment.